So welcome everyone to the science communication finale for the Summer Library Challenge. It's really hard to believe it's finally over. Um, we kicked things off in June with a picnic party here at the library. And since then, it's been nine weeks of different missions uh, that we've offered you. And all told, you've submitted almost 200 activities. So that's a lot of library action. Um, so we really want to thank you, the participants, for um, the success that it's been. And the biggest benefit from my perspective has been the building relationships uh, with new people and strengthening relationships with people that we already know. Um, those relationships help us understand how best to support you in the research process. Um, and of course, science communication is a part of that. Um, so we have three speakers today with different takes on science communication. Um, and as for the library's role in the research process, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that in 2019, science librarians have a pretty big toolkit for supporting researchers. Um, so I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, who is a prime example of a Swiss Army knife of science librarianship. Um, so Jamie Roberts, you provided a brief bio, but I hope you don't mind if I expand on it a little bit. Um, so Jamie has two master's degrees in both conservation and library science. She's been part of the NOAA Central Library Bibliometrics team since 2016. Um, but she's also part of the research team creating tailored bibliographies and in addition she contributes to the operations of the NOAA institutional repository which, uh, which helps ensure perpetual and open access to NOAA research. Um, and then finally I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, Jamie's talents also encompass being the resident curator and rare book maven of the NOAA <laughs> Central Library. Um, so take it away Jamie. Thank you. I'm going to continue to just not really give you much in the way of bios from now on because that was lovely. Thank you. Um, hi, so I'm Jamie Roberts and today I'm just going to talk about bibliometrics and science communication. So first of all, I'm going to remember how to use the clicker. There we go. Okay. First of all, what is bibliometrics? It's the scientific and quantitative analysis of academic research, a way of measuring the authorship, publication, and use of literature as a proxy for research. And what does that even mean? Um, and what it means is that we're, we're using things that we can measure, like the number of articles that NOAA publishes in a year and how many citations they get and, and other things like that to get a sense of things that we can't measure. We, we don't know how many people have read our publications or if they think they're useful or if they think they're you know, well curated or if they agree or disagree with them. Um, but, but we create metric, these metrics so that we can hopefully talk about our output, output sorry, and our productivity and hopefully convey a sense of how they're being received and how effective NOAA is at disseminating scientific research. It's, it's potentially a way to think about science communication in terms of how well are we getting information out to the scientific community. So let's talk about how we do bibliometrics at NOAA. So we have our bibliometrics data set. Uh, weekly, we do a massive, massive search of Web of Science, which is an indexing service, and using our very, very daunting, impressive, and highly curated search string that occasionally still pulls in some real funky stuff that we have to weed out by hand. Um, so we manual review, manually review everything that we receive from that search, look at it, make sure it, it's what we're looking for that's from a NOAA author, and then we also do a little bit of markup to it. And we add a little bit of data here and there, like fiscal year and other info to help us down the road. So this is, uh, we have this internally. Uh, it's over 13,000 citations at this point. So it is, a, it is a large hunk of very highly curated data. And so on a typical year, what this looks like is we do these annual searches and data curation. We actually have a team of four people that work on curating, reviewing, and, and adding information to that, to those records. Um, and then that information, we take it, we look at it, we analyze it, and it turns you into both a quarterly and an annual report that go to the NOAA Research Council. Uh, and for the past two years, we've also contributed data to the NOAA Science Report, and we're gearing up to do that for the 2018 report. It's very exciting. Um, it's not on this slide because we actually gather data for that slightly differently. And if you are curious about that, we'll talk about that later because that is more than 
10 minutes difference from this, from this overview of bibliometrics. So what kind of things do we measure? So we talk about publication and citation metrics. And so publication metrics, I think, are really easy to understand. It's a lot of counting. It's a lot of like how many articles, what year were they published, what office did they come from, what journal did they wind up in, what subject area, how were they funded, really basic stuff like that. Uh, citation metrics, we can talk about how many times articles were cited. And you know, just looking at a citation count, you don't know if people cited it because they loved it or they hated it, if they thought it was a great example of research or if they're citing you because they thought it was a terrible example of research. Um, but you know they looked. You know, they looked and they thought about it enough that they published a paper and mentioned you in it. Um, so we have citation rate, and we also have H index and percentile ranks, which just real quick, if you've heard anything about bibliometrics, you've probably heard H index, um, which is kind of, it's kind of a weird number that we throw around, but it's the threshold of citations versus publishing. So you can see this is, I think it works much better if you show it as a chart instead of just talking about it as a number. But you can see this is, you maybe can't see because the numbers are kind of small. But so this is an office that has over 300 publications. Um, their H index is 56. All of those publications have at least 56 citations. And that's why the H index is 56. If I publish five papers and they all have five citations, um, my H index is five. If I publish one paper and it has five citations, my H index is one. If I publish five papers and none of them have more than one citation, my H index is one. Does that? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Um, no, it's number of papers. Yeah, sorry. I should look at the slide. It is far larger than my actual printed notes. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, and then, okay, so that has, you know, that has an H index of 56. Okay, so a bunch of those papers have been cited 56 times. Is 56 a lot of citations? It really depends on the discipline that that article was published in um, and what the publishing cycle is for that, you know, for them and how long does it take people to produce research, get it out and talk about it. So then it's really helpful to talk about percentile rankings. And so if it's, if a paper is, I mean, I don't know how many citations does it have, but is it in the top 1% of all papers cited in that field that year? That's really impressive. So we often talk about like the top one or 10% of papers cited in a field that year as another sort of plot point of, this is gonna sound corny and get away from me, but we really talk about how bibliometrics are, all the different metrics are plot points in a story. And if you look at just one, you know that one thing, but if you look at multiples then you get a much greater, broader sense of what's going on. Uh, so that was, yes, publication and citation metrics. And then we also have collaboration metrics, which I kind of, love and they definitely make the prettiest charts. Um, collaboration metrics, we can talk about, okay, you published an article or your office published an article, but uh, who are you collaborators? Who are you working with? I'm realizing this slide is so tiny, but that top one, if you're in the room, is showing how different authors are connected and who they're collaborating with. Um, and then I think it's, I think you'd see the line office collaboration at NOAA and then also the geographic distribution of collaborators who authors are working with. So those are all things that we can look at. And just for a real life example from NOAA data, these numbers are all from the 2018 annual science report. We're working on the 2019 and I don't think I'm allowed to share data from that just yet. It's very similar, I promise you. Um, but you can see that when you look at this, 92% of articles published by NOAA between 2011 and 2017 have been cited in another peer-reviewed publication. And they've been cited over a quarter of a million times. So NOAA research is definitely being seen and being utilized. It is out there, it is not only available, but it's being picked up. Um, and just for a fun fact, you can also see that we have the, 
the pie chart of the top seven subject categories that NOAA publishes in, uh, that actually covers 82% of NOAA articles. We're not doing a lot outside of uh, meteorology, rain and freshwater biology, oceanography, environmental sciences, fisheries, ecology, and geosciences. And please don't ask me to name any of those other fields because they're escaping me right now. Optics used to be big and we're not doing as much in optics anymore. There's been some transitions. Um, and this is also, this is our peer collaboration from 2011 to 2017. I think well, the thing that immediately jumps out at me is if you don't have a coastline, you're far less likely to do research with NOAA. And that kind of makes sense. So moving on from that, I just wanted to show you real quick. This is an example of a researcher impact report, which is a product that the library just launched this spring. So we do a lot of things that focus on NOAA as a whole or line and program offices. But if you are an individual researcher with NOAA, uh, if you'd like to contact us, we would be happy to make one of these for you, as long as you have an up-to-date uh, ORCID or researcher ID. And you can just email us at the Bibliometrics Program for more information about that. Uh, and that is really, did I talk way too fast? No, I think I'm pretty good on time, okay. Um, that's really everything I had today. Um, I can take a couple questions right now, but also if you have Bibliometrics questions, you can email the team. We have a page on the website and we also have a libguide which just has more information about, uh, ooh, information about bibliometrics in general. Open. Anyone have any questions in the room? Yeah. Are the quarterly reports, do you run the quarterly reports automatically and are they available to you know, employees? If you are interested in them, we could probably get them to you. They're not widely distributed and I don't think that's I don't think it's an issue. I think they're just not widely distributed. Um, it's something that we, yeah, we there's different things that we have to generate and like collate by hand. Um, the annual report is like a very polished report product and the quarterly report is still lovely, but it's essentially an Excel workbook. Um, but yeah, like, let's, let's talk. We can get you some, do you want data? We can, we'd love to give you data. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, we have two questions online. Cool. Um, so how can offices uh, generate percentile ranks and collaboration network analyses? And you want me to repeat the question? I think they might have heard me, but you can. Okay, how can summarize. offices generate percentile ranks and collaboration rates? Uh, the best way to do that would be to email us at the Bibliometrics Program and ask us to help you with that data, just because we, again, we have that really highly curated data set um, and that's where all that information lies. And just because of the size and density of it, it's not something that is easy for us to like make widely available. And do you measure alt metrics as well? We are not currently measuring alt metrics. Um, and it's, it's definitely a thing that we talk about. A, like general awareness of NOAA is I mean, it's very important. Um, it's just, it's such a, I mean, it's still, I'm just gonna put my foot in my mouth like seven times. Cause I wanna be like, it's still relatively new and it's not that new, but in terms of like, a, like science in general, you know, it's not, we don't have, you know, 50 plus years to, to work with. Um, the tools that you need to measure, measure it with and whatever it's, we have our existing program, it's really funny, our existing program started in 2012 and it wasn't until 2017 and we had five years of data under our belt that we were like, aha, an established bibliometrics program. So these things really can take some time to establish and grow. Uh, we don't currently do alt metrics. I don't know if that'll come, become a priority in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so our next speaker, Monica Allen, currently serves as both Acting Director of Communications for NOAA Research and Head of the NOAA Research Media Outreach Team. She and her team of communicators provide internal and constituent communications as well as media outreach designed to boost the understanding of NOAA's world-class research on weather, climate, ocean, atmosphere, and the Great Lakes. 
Prior to her current positions, Allen was a public affairs officer for NOAA Fisheries and served in detail in NOAA's Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs as a liaison to Congress for Fisheries. Monica joined NOAA in 2007 after a 25-year career as an award-winning journalist in New England, covering environment, education, and government for newspapers from Connecticut to Maine. She has a bachelor's degree in history from Brown University and a master's degree in marine affairs from the University of Rhode Island. Thank you. This? Okay. Thank you for coming today. And uh, I'm gonna give you kind of a lightning talk about media relations and media outreach and how to get our stories into the, to the old media, the TV, radio, print, uh, web, that kind of stuff. This right. Oh, that's why. Okay. Right. Okay. So one one of the best things I want to stress is that uh, working directly with reporters in person can really help you get your story out more effectively. People like to talk to people, and stories tend to have more context. It's not always possible. So we do a lot more online. We do a lot more on phone and whatnot and stuff like that. But this is always good. And in this picture is um, Grace Hood from Colorado Public Radio talking with my public affairs officer, Teo Stein, and one of the scientists at the Earth System Research Lab. So a good thing to know too about um, working with the media is a little bit about the culture of the media so that you know who you're working with. And here's a couple of things to remember. For the most part, of course there are exceptions, but it's not a really high paid uh, occupation for most reporters, especially starting reporters, um, long days, 24-hour deadlines, they're responsible for doing a lot, uh, print, web, social media, video, take their own photographs, more and more things on each person. Um, they often have multiple beats uh, and comprehensiveness versus space and time. They don't have a lot of space and time or an ability to do comprehensive stories often. Um, but there are exceptions, of course. And then there's lots of staff reductions and lots of action in that field. There's a lot of um, consolidation going on and there's a lot of competition. But most reporters want to get the story right and it's, our, it's in our interest to help them do that. So here's a, a more, as you prepare, you want to think about um, these, these, these key areas. Who is your audience? That's probably the most important thing to think about when you're wanting to pitch a story to um, the media. So you understand that really that's who you're talking to, not so much the person, uh, the reporter, but the audience that they work for, that they communicate to. So good research on that. And public affairs can help you with that. And the line communications offices can help you with that because we have a lot of experience in public affairs and that's the NOAA comms. And each line has a NOAA comms person or two or three. Um, a lot of experience with all the media that are out there doing stories about our topics. We know. The, the people themselves have relationships with them. We know what kinds of things interest them. We also know what kinds of audiences they have. Uh, so the message, you want to figure out what your message is, is going to be that you really want to get there. And there's a lot, lot, to, lot more to that than just this sentence, but I'll touch on that a little bit more as I go along. And then who's going to give the message? And you have a lot of options on that. Whoops. We don't have it there. And here's the thing that sometimes we, we make sure that we um, encourage when we get people ready for media interviews. You have the goods. You're in control. It, it doesn't feel that way, especially if you don't do it that much. You think, oh, I've got to answer their questions. I've got to you know, be ready for all their questions. And that's true, too. But really, there's no story without what you're bringing to the table. You know, So keep that in mind as you try to be in the driver's seat when you do the story. And, and a couple other things, you know, set boundaries. And by that, I mean, like, you, you might want to um, have the public affairs help you with this, like a good time to do an interview, like a good amount of time, not open-ended, because sometimes you, you might not bring stuff to, to bear that would really help the story if it goes on and on and on. Sometimes, a, you know, a good time might be, depending on the topic, you know, half hour, an hour, uh, but it's good to have that in mind with the reporter having it in mind too. So 
stay in your lane, talk about what you know, uh, stick to your points that you've kind of prepared. Um, of course, you're going to go outside them because you're a human being, and that's but, but you have those points at the ready and back pocket answers to hard questions and recognize the quicksand. And then I'm not going to go into a lot about pivot and bridge, but um, I can basically pivot and bridge is something human beings do all the time when they move away from topics that they don't either have expertise on or they don't really, they're not really qualified to talk about. So that's what I'm talking about with that. And that's a good thing to practice. Uh, so I can help you with that if you need help before an interview. And then here's too many interview tips to, but uh, some of the important ones is uh, that I want to stress is it's a conversation. You know, it's it's sometimes I think people that aren't that experienced doing interviews they think they just want to give a lot of information and they're not necessarily letting the reporter get in there and ask a question. And it's very important to have a conversation back and forth. That's going to help the way the story comes out. It's going to help you along the way knowing that the journalist is following and, and catching what you're, where, where you're going and you can kind of um, hear when they're not and explain things a little better. So keep it, keep it a conversation and uh, all these other tips too are helpful. Um, selecting your messenger and here's a picture of uh, Amy Holman who's NOAA's regional coordinator for Alaska region and we chose her for a story that we did this spring in Alaska, we were taking Al Roker from NBC Today up to see climate change in Uktavik, which is the top of the world. And so we, we kind of found all the really interesting stuff that NOAA and some of our partners were doing up in Barrow, which used to be called Barrow, now called Uktavik. And we had, um, you know, launching buoys. We had showing them our observatory where we measure greenhouse gases. Uh, and this is where we are right now We're inside one of the uh, satellite receiving stations of our observatory in Barrow. And Amy is explaining to Al what's going on, you know, the science of it. And we picked Amy to be one of our lead spokesmen because she lives in Alaska. She's been to Barrow many times. She knows the whole story, uh, especially the human impact of all of our science. And she knows the people. Uh, so she did a great job. So we, we had, she's not like, like the expert on greenhouse gases and she's not an expert on the crazy weather they're having, but she has an awareness of all of that and can speak well about it. She also knows how to drive a snowmobile, and that was key because we were launching buoys. So Amy was able to do that too. Okay, now this is the hard stuff. Hard just because it's kind of the slides look a little bit dense, but I'm going to kind of summarize this for you, and the, the links are here so you can go to them if you want to. There's a couple things you need to know if you do talk to the media, and maybe you already know this, and if you do, I apologize for repeating it. It's the NOAA, the Department of Commerce Communications Policy. And it's it's a really good policy for us. I gotta say it has some very good points in it that really help us. And so I'm gonna go over the things that help us and then the things that guide you so you can avoid getting into situations that are not so great for you or for NOAA. What helps us is that it strongly encourages scientists to talk about their research, their scientific and technical research, go for it. Really, we want the public to know about it. The policy says that. And it um, also says that they, the scientist doesn't have to check with public affairs, me, my colleagues, before they do that. Say that they're at a conference and a reporter comes up to them, they can just go ahead and talk about their research and they should feel free to do that. Although the policy does encourage, and so do I, that they move us in because we can help them you know, put their best foot forward. We can help them get ready. We can help them by finding out where the reporter's going, who else they've interviewed, all sorts of stuff that help you put on a better story, get a better story into, into the, the broader public. So that's that. Um, the, one of the, the areas of exception are where, we, where the policy says that you really do need to loop in NOAA communications, the public affairs staff, this involves more formal news releases, such as a press release, uh, a press conference, uh, a, a media interview with CBS, NBC, major media interview. Let us know. It doesn't mean we're going to like hold your hand or be there, but let us know because we need to tell leadership about that so they're not surprised. And then uh, finally, the three things to remember that you really, as a 
you know, bench scientists or as, or as even just as no employee, whether you're a scientist or not, should be very careful about giving an interview about and really avoid it actually, frankly, is policy, management, and budget. Those are areas that we ask that all of our scientists come to us. And then what we do is we take those questions from reporters and we get them to the, the appropriate budget and policy or leadership office. So, and so we encourage the um, scientists to basically pivot on that one and say, well, you know, that is not my expertise. Let me get public affairs to help you with that. Just simply move it away because that's the area where you really don't have a carve out. Oops, I keep doing that. Okay. And then just sort of some main things to always know when you're out there in the field, when you're doing a, doing a story, when you're helping media is you represent NOAA, you um, have the full force of the federal government right there in you when you talk. So be aware of that. And the reporter may know nothing about your subject. They have, they have an angle. They will take your spiciest quote. So be prepared to be quoted on everything you say. That's just the way you have to operate. So you, because they want that one. Um, and here's some best practices about getting ready. And really the last one's super important because you want to think really hard about what it is you want the story to have in it. And that's what you're going to focus on saying and showing, demonstrating, bringing them into the field to show, show that point. And you're going to repeat it several times so that it's clear. And then finally, it, pretty much every reporter I've ever worked with almost asks a question at the end of their interview, which is something along these lines. Is there anything I didn't cover you'd like to add? Is there something I should have asked, but I didn't? Be ready for that, because that's your chance to really leave we leave the reporter with the most memorable thing you want them to have. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions in the room? Yeah. Hi, Art Madison. Um, I sometimes sometimes have difficulty in my three offices at NOAA selling an idea to NOAA Public Affairs. Mm -hmm. Why isn't this a good idea for media release or something else? What guidance do you have for people about um, what are the media most interested in as a story? That's a good question. Oh, sorry. Come over here. That's a good question. Well, trying to think of, look at what they're doing that's the best guide, you know, what are they, and I'm just thinking about, because I, I have the ability to see what they call us about, I will tell you that if they can get out on a boat, go on a plane, and see science in action, that will be the most interesting thing for them, because they'll be able to get visuals, they'll be able to get video, they'll get a feel for it, they'll have fun, so that's the best story we can give them. I, I believe, you know, Al Roker, that was a seven minutes of total Noah, you know, in the limelight and what we did and why it was important and who our cool people were, who did those things and the place that we worked in that was so interesting to see. That's the kind of story that sells the best. Um, if you can get out of the office, get off of a PowerPoint, get off of a report and be where the, where the action is. Like right now we have a press conference going on in, uh, in uh, Salina, Kansas. We have 200 people, they're not all media, but a lot of them are that have come to get on a DC-8 plane that NASA will fly over fires that are taking place in farm fields. Those are gonna be some great stories. They'll, they'll, get, they'll get video of fire and then they'll be able to talk to the researchers on the plane, you know, like really up close personal um, hear their voices, see them, see what makes them tick, get that in the story, uh, either through video or photographs. Um, that's, that's why sometimes, you know, it's hard to sell some stories that are monodimensional or bureaucratic. Those don't work very well. Reports, you know, even papers don't work so well unless you can find something that has some juice to it. Like, that's one of the reasons why I advise that if you have a paper that you think is really groundbreaking, exciting, 
get it to us early so we can be thinking of some creative way to pull, pull it out. I mean, did that answer your question? Yeah. Maybe too much. <laughs> and how do uh, does someone get a hold of you? How does a okay. person? Yeah. Well, um, I didn't give up the whole org chart, but in every line of NOAA, there is a public affairs officer that is assigned to your line. I'm in research. Tail Stein is in research. He's out in Boulder. Phone number, email. And also, if you get approached by the media by email and you don't know what to do, just forward it on to us and say, I um, want you to be aware of this. I'd like to chat with you about getting some help. In weather service, there's, there's nwspa.gov. You can just send it to their email. And there's right now, there's four public affairs officers in the weather service. There's Susan Buchanan's the head uh, in the ocean service. Brady Phillips is the head over there. Um, I don't know what other lines I have here, but uh, OMAO, it's David Hall. That stuff is on NOAA.gov, actually. If you go and look under who we are, you'll see communications and you'll see the list. And if you have any questions about that, I can send you that. So just email me. Uh, my email is at the beginning. Oops. Oops. Okay. Oh, thanks. Thank you. And you also have communicators that are working in your lines, and they all know who the public affairs people are for media, and they all are, some of them are very, very good at helping get you ready for media interviews or talk with you about a good story, a way to get a story out. We have some great ones here in the room uh, Katie, Claire, Tiffany, and I, we've got tons of great communicators who know good stories. Brooke, you know, there's a ton of them here. And, and we're, used, we're doing more and more web stories to try to help the media. That They're not like strict press releases. They're more like sort of stories that have a little bit more flavor to them, maybe um, written in a way that the media might write them. And we're sharing those, and those are helping the media as well because they're pressed for time, and sometimes they run them pretty much for me. Any other questions? Thank you. So Thank you. So our next speaker, Brooke Carney, serves as the Chief of Staff for the National Sea Grant Office and the Communications Coordinator for the National Sea Grant College Program. Uh, Carney and her team highlight the science and stories coming from Sea Grant programs across the country through multiple channels, including social media outlets. Prior to joining NOAA, Brooke worked with the National Park Service as a science communication specialist for the Alaska region. She has also served as the Coastal Training Program Coordinator for Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve in Florida, where she specialized in developing and delivering training programs for diverse audiences and facilitating management and policy development processes. Brooke holds master's degrees in biology from the University of Alaska Anchorage and in public administration from Georgia Southern University. So without further ado, here is Brooke. Thanks. Okay, so I guess, um, so hi, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about um, the ways in which you can use social media, um, perhaps as a scientist, um, perhaps as a non-science professional working for NOAA, um, or representing a NOAA program. So I was trying to think of my audience here today and, and um, the different types of people who, who may be in the room. So that's what I've catered this, this to. So I, I hope this is not a news flash to anyone that social media is a powerful communication tool. Um, in fact, I would venture to say that no serious outward facing communications operation um, is doing much without social media as a component, right? Um, social media can be a standalone tool, but often it's used to draw attention to a media story, to a web story, to something else happening um, somewhere there, you know, out there um, in the world for, for folks to see. Um, social media is free. 80% of the U.S. population is on some form of social media, so you should be too if you're wanting to communicate um, about your work. Um, no specific training is needed for social media, though there are lots of best practices, there are lots of do's and don'ts, and there are even laws that govern your um, activity on social media at work. Um, there are dozens of platforms to choose from. 
I would say that the platform or platforms you choose uh, should fit your audience and your communication goals. Uh, if you're a scientist who's a little nervous about social media, um, feel good knowing that you're not the first scientist to go out on social media um, trying to increase the science literacy of our population. There are many great role models for you um, to observe. So if you're going to engage in social media activities, it is very important to know the rules of engagement, both sort of the behavioral norms of, of engagement rules, as well as the very official get you in trouble um, NOAA and DOC policies and laws that uh, cover activities of, of federal employees on social media. So I have, these are sort of the, the basics of engagement. Um, first rule is to speak with one voice. If you are a science-based program at NOAA, um, you may have 10 people running a social media account, but that social media account and the messages being posted should present as one voice. Um, it's not sort of Harry's got the, you know, the controls today and is spouting off about what he likes. Um, Latisse has them tomorrow and she's sort of talking in her way. A program um, appearance on social media should always be one voice. Likewise, if you are um, representing yourself as a scientist or professional, um, it's good to sort of uh, not have multiple personalities on a social media platform. Um, that can get quite confusing to your audience and leave them not knowing what to expect. Um, a very, maybe I should have put this first because it's probably the most important, um, is to be accurate with your posts. Um, you're not doing anybody any favors if you try to go out um, into the social media sphere with information about science that is not accurate and that is not factual. Um, I can give you some uh, fun, juicy gossip about some science-based social media accounts who sort of got a little too tabloid-ish um, and their reputation tanked as a result. So being accurate and factual is critical on social media. And part of that is admitting your mistakes, right? If you mess up, if you misquote something, um, if you misinterpret a study that's 10 pages long and you're trying to get it into a tweet, fess up, uh, fix it. Uh, tell folks you were wrong and, and give them the correction. Um, from a context of representing a NOAA program or being a NOAA professional representing yourself, it's always a good practice to link to publicly available websites. Um, in fact, I, I don't know if it's in the DOC policy, but it's in the policy of many government agencies um, that no, no member of society should have to follow a third party um, platform such as Twitter to get the information about a public program, right? It should always connect to that, that public website. Um, repost and like carefully, um, it, you know, as you're growing up, your parents say, oh, you know, the folks you associate with, they influence your reputation. Well, so does liking, reposting, um, commenting on sort of accounts that may be questionable in terms of their accuracy um, and fact being rooted in facts, or they may be super opinionated about something and you just happen to agree with it as the individual posting on the official NOAA Sea Grant account, right? But it's just be careful about that. Um, you, want, you want your engagements on social media to follow the voice you have um, as, as a program or, a, or an individual professional. Um, copyright laws apply. Um, if you're trying to uh, post about a, a story on um, some buoys that were deployed in Alaska and you go and grab a photo that NBC took or CB, whichever the, the platform was, um, Copyright laws apply. You need to give credit, and where it's appropriate, you need to ask for permission. Um, there are pretty specific uh, DOC policies that govern social media um, activity, uh, as well as NOAA. Um, if your program is going to have any kind of social media account, or if you're going to have a professional individual social media account that is an official NOAA account, um, where you're saying, hi, I'm an employee of NOAA, and I'm going to tell you what I know as a professional, um, there are specific processes you need to go through to get those um, approved and sort of validated with a stamp of approval. And I can go into details offline after this, but not for this 10 minute talk. Um, if you've never heard of the Hatch Act, you should look it up if you're a federal employee or a fellow who might become a federal employee or even a contractor who works with federal employees or represents federal programs. Uh, you should know what the Hatch Act is. Um, there's a lot of uh, details about the Hatch Act that um, go into the social media sphere uh, and you should pay attention to those. 
Um, EEO laws cross over into social media. They cross over into social media whether it's your work account or your personal account that says you're an employee of NOAA. Um, so be a good person, basically, um, and don't say mean things. Uh, and there are other laws that apply as well, um, but I'm going to leave it just at a high level. So the other thing about social media um, is have fun. Social media is a fun platform. It is very rarely super serious um, and know what works. There are buku articles and blogs out there um, for each individual social media platform telling you what works and doesn't work for a particular platform. Um, Audrey got me into this mess, and so I figured I would put one of her posts um, <laughs> uh, that she put on the Noah Seagrant Twitter account recently, and it's a great example of all the things that work. So at the top, so we have our Noah, our official Noah Seagrant um, account up here. So she starts with some humor. Um, who do fish call when they have a broken fin? A lake sturgeon, of course. Um, so she's got some humor in there. The next thing on the post says hashtag national tell a joke day. The other thing she did with this is she um, tied into uh, an event that's happening online that's marked with a hashtag that may have nothing to do with NOAA. It may have nothing to do with science. It's national tell a joke day, right? But we used that trending event to bring our science message to the Twitter um, crew. Um, she lets folks know where they can find more information Read about Lake, hashtag Sturgeon. If people want to learn more about Sturgeon on Twitter, they can click that. Um, from Michigan Sea Grant, and she gives the link. This in and of itself, this read more about Lake Sturgeon from Michigan Sea Grant, that is our communication goal. One of our goals as National Sea Grant Office is to promote the work of the Sea Grant programs around the country. And so we're like, check, we're meeting a, a communication goal there. She also gives photo credit. She includes a nice, uh, catchy photo that draw people's attention. If this was just text, people would scroll right past it. The other great thing she does is she includes alternate text. Um, as federal employees and with federal uh, social media accounts, uh, we must be compliant with Section 508 of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and adding alter alternate text to that post um, did that. So lots of best practices um, on that post. The other thing to note is that don't, if you're not the communicator sort of in charge of the social media for your program, that's okay. Um, Monica talked about sort of people um, wanting to communicate with people or interact with people. Sometimes personal accounts are just as, if not more effective than program-based accounts. This is the personal account, which is very curated and very focused on science of uh, my fellow from last year, Katie O'Reilly. She's at Dr. Catfish. And she also uses a ton of humor um, to engage a lot of young people about science. Her target audience is students and sort of sort of K through 20, right? Uh, you know, little kids through graduate students um, in, into science literacy. Um, so she uses a lot of humor, but it's always very well curated and it's with a lot of facts um, behind it. The last thing I want to leave you with is that successful social media campaigns are usually not accidents. If somebody is on social media and they're having continual success, they're not just winging it. Whether it's written out or just in their mind, I would encourage you to write it out. They have specific goals. They have specific individuals they're trying to reach. They're looking at trends. They're paying attention. They're thinking about their specific audiences. They're thinking about between platforms, Twitter, Facebook, um, Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever it may be, um, they are thinking about what works for those platforms um, and they're thinking about goals and they're thinking about plans. Um, one of the things we do in Sea Grant, and you made me think of it with your bibliometric um, chart, is that we look at the impact of our social media posts. So um, every few months we run a chart and we look at effort, sort of the amount of posts we're putting out into the world versus the impacts those posts are having. And we have to calibrate it so that it's on the same scale, but what we're trying to do is make sure that we're having maximum effort or maximum impact for the effort we're putting out there. And that's all I've got. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Anyone have a question in the room? 
yeah, what's the alt thing? I do know what that is. Actually. Oh, so um, if it's for um, folks who need an electronic screen reader to see what's happening on Twitter, it's easy enough to read the text, but when it gets to the photo, um, if you hover over it, it will give a description of that photograph. Yeah, so we use it on our websites, but more and more social media platforms are getting good about allowing you to enter that text as well. So like audio? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not seeing any questions online. Okay, that's fine. But um, last call in the room. Okay, thank you guys so much yeah. for uh, tuning in.